Good afternoon. Today's webinar's topic is leadership diversity, board governance should reflect all stakeholders. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Joanna Brown, and I will be the webinar organizer for today. We want to make sure today's presentation is extremely valuable for you. Uh, so we ask that you submit all questions by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your question. Our moderator today is Dr. Ellen Burtz Cooper. Dr. Burtz Cooper is the senior managing partner of Improved Consulting and Training Group, a firm that provides personal and professional development training, coaching, and consultation. I'll turn it over to Ellen. Oh, thank you, Joanna. Hello, everyone. We've got an exciting panel planned for you today. We have a great lineup of panelists. Before we dig in, I'd like for Richie to come up for us and give us a little bit of background about himself and why this panel today before we dig in. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, my name is Richard Sarkar. I am a partner in the Cleveland office of Dinsmore & Scholl. Uh, amongst many of my roles here, I'm one of the leaders of our ESG practice, which covers, amongst many things, uh, board and leadership diversity. So we've, you know, we convened this panel because, you know, several, even though several studies have established that there's a correlation between diversity and financial performance, um, you know, and in, and in fact, McKinsey quantified it by saying diverse companies are 33% more likely to have greater financial returns than their less diverse industry peers. Um, and another study has generated that at, um, you know, 19% high innovation, higher innovation for companies that are more diverse. You still have, we still have a problem with uh, diverse leadership at both the management and board level. Um, and I really think that the quandary that we see was best summed up by the SEC commissioner, Allison Heron Lee, when she had uh, she wrote, I can never buy into the view that some 40% of the population, if we're talking about minorities, or 50% of the population, if we're talking about women, mustn't rationalize their inclusion in corporate board boardrooms and elsewhere in economic terms instead of the reverse. And I think that that's you know, really prescient in, in you know, why groups of people need to justify why they should be in leadership um, as opposed to people justifying why or explaining why we are not is really what we're getting to today. Um, you know, we've made some progress. A fall 2020 analyses of the 3,000 largest publicly traded U.S. companies found that uh, just 12.5% of board directors were from underrepresented uh, ethnic and racial groups. And I say some progress because that was up from 10% in 2015. But the, the, the report also found that only 4% of the directors were black. And while female directors had 21, had held 21% uh, of board seats. And those are still, those are increases, but very slight from 4% and 13%. Um, in often cases, the majority white directors often will, when we're interviewed, will often talk about not having enough qualified candidates from these underrepresentative groups. Well, however, female directors and minority directors often just point to the lack of prioritization of the issue. Um, and I think that that's where we should start our conversation and just talk about, you know, how can we increase these numbers and where are we uh, in this? And to that end, we've assembled a great panel that I know um, Ellen's going to have fun with today. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. You've already started us off pretty hot on the topic. That's some uh, interesting data that I hope people are taking in. Before we start, why don't we do a go around so we know who's on the panel. And I'll first start with Todd, and I'll just have you give just a few sentences about your background, because you'll be answering questions from your point of expertise. So Todd, I'll have you start with just a bit about your background. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, yes, Todd Fetterman, Managing Director of North Coast Ventures. We are a group of over 300 individuals in Cleveland who have uh, invested capital in startups. Most of those startups are in Ohio, some are across the Midwest, but we've deployed about $70 million into 60 plus uh, startups uh, in a fairly risky area uh, that we uh, know have potential and that we work very hard over a long period of time to drive success for us as investors and for uh, the region because we feel that uh, any successful region really needs a robust innovation and startup uh, economy. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that, Todd. I got some good questions lined up for you. Kimberly, give us a bit about your background. Thank you, Ellen. So I'm Kimberly Reed. I'm the Managing Director of Talent for Blue Point Capital. And I actually have roughly 25 years plus of experience. Uh, much of it has been in publicly traded organizations, uh, such as companies such as General Motors, Johnson Controls. Uh, I've been in the trucking industry. I've been in building uh, equipment industry. So I'll be speaking on a whole plethora of experience, both in publicly traded companies, privately held companies, as well as private equity. Thank you. Lot to draw from there, Kimberly. Pamela Gibbs, give us a little bit about your background. Uh, hi, and thank you for allowing me to participate on this panel. Uh, my name is Pam Gibbs. I am, a, I'm, unlike others, I am a lifetime public servant. Uh, I have been in the federal government for a long time. Uh, first as a lawyer doing civil rights work, uh, really around contractors and affirmative action. And then I moved into the diversity space about 10 years ago when I was asked to join the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to head their Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. Um, and so I've been in this role, it's quickly approaching 10 years and it's been uh, just a fascinating um, ride to really begin to understand the financial services industry uh, and some of the challenges it faces that I think are unique to the financial services industry around diversity and inclusion. Yeah, we're gonna love to hear about some of those unique challenges. Thank you, Eric. Eric, I think you might mute it. Let's get him off mute here. <laughs> Thanks again for the introduction. Eric Keen, I am a managing director for uh, RSR Partners uh, in their board and CEO practice. Uh, RSR is a boutique executive search firm. Uh, prior to joining RSR, I ran my own firm, uh, Keen Advisory Group, for about 15, 20 years. Uh, I'm a Cleveland native. Uh, spend time, a lot of time between Cleveland and Chicago and uh, have worked on a variety of senior executive and board level searches and, and look forward to the dialogue today. Wonderful, I'm looking forward as well. So let's go ahead and dig in. Um, we're gonna get started. I think we should just dive right in there. So Richard, you started off with some interesting data. So I'm just gonna go right for it. Let's dig in and talk about what are some of the current regulations or proposed rules that are coming that are related to board diversity. I imagine everyone's thinking, you know, are there going to be anything that's governing what boards look like? Can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, there are. Tr there's a trend now across states uh, to actually institute rules that are um, dictating that certain boards, depending on their size, should have a certain number of diverse board members. California is probably the most notable. Uh, any company that is based out of California, or sorry, I should say, any public company based out of California um, is required to have a minimum number of female directors or face sanctions. Um, and then also now a minimum number of what they consider underrepresented or, or, or diverse organizations. New York has had a similar rule in place. Illinois is moving in that direction. Um, about, from my count, about 11 to 15 states are now in the, in the, in the process of either instituting these rules or at least strongly considering them. Um, and then there are, with respect to the NASDAQ, um, the NASDAQ, any company that's listed on, NAS, on the NASDAQ needs to um, uh, elect at least one female director and one uh, director from an underrepresented minority or who identifies as LGBTQ+. Um, that rule was recently approved by the SEC, um, and it went through you know, a fair amount of debate, and, and a lot was written about it. Um, but that is you know, a, a regulatory exchange, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a stock exchange making a rule like that is, is rather significant. Um, it also falls in the same area of you know, Goldman Sachs will not take any uh, company public unless they have a diverse director. Um, so you're seeing these trends uh, across states where they are instituting these sorts of rules. Um, I will, but I also should say that in almost every state where this rule has been instituted and including uh, with the NASDAQ rule, there are groups that have immediately sued saying that such rules are unconstitutional um, and attacking 
uh, you know, the underlying uh, basis for the rules, which is, you know, unfortunately not uncommon in these types of things. Anytime um, there is a religion, uh, sorry, a, a, a government, a regulatory proscription on something, you all, you know, you often will see someone fighting back and, you know, that's how the system is supposed to work. Um, but it does not mean that the, the, the trends should, uh, the lack of regulation should not be, um, or sorry, a, a regulation really should not be the reason why you're adding, you know, diverse board members, considering the benefit that have been, has been documented with respect to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, innovation with respect to representing um, your overall customer population, things of that nature. Wonderful, thank you. And and Pamela, I'm gonna come right over to you. No, I can't resist coming to you with this one. When you think about it, with the NASDAQ rule and people are challenging that, from your perspective, do you see other entities that are gonna come out with similar rules like that from your perspective? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, first I'll just lay the foundation uh, about what the SEC does and why the SEC is involved in the space of board diversity. You know, the NASDAQ rule is not the first time that the SEC stepped into the water of board diversity. Uh, you know, our goal is to protect investors, to be the advocate for investors. And what we've seen over the last couple of years, I would say the last 10 years, particularly after the uh, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, is a rise up of shareholders and investors wanting more transparency into what their company was doing, into their investments. And so as a result of that, in 2009 was the first time that the SEC took action and required that publicly traded corporations disclose uh, in their disclosures uh, what role diversity played in their board selection. So just to, uh, about the SEC, even though we have a large jurisdiction, we are a relatively small agency. We are roughly only 4,500 people and we oversee and regulate the capital markets and we are the advocate for the investor. So as a result of that, when you think about who do we regulate? So we don't really regulate publicly traded corporations. We regulate their disclosures that they submit to us. So we develop and oversee the disclosures that they send to us. And then on the other side, where the broker dealers, investment advisors, the stock exchanges, transfer agents, we regulate that. So there, so just, just to give you a little bit of a context. So on the publicly traded corporation side, the SEC required in their disclosure forms in 2009 that companies begin to talk about diversity, but that didn't hit hard enough. Uh, and so it was tweaked again, uh, requiring them to be a little bit more specific regarding the demographics in 20, I think that was 2018. And so when NASDAQ came with its proposed rule, uh, and I, I would say it was a bold move, um, and a bold move by the commission. So it wasn't a, a complete 5-0. I believe it was 3-2 three, three, vote that approved the NASDAQ rule. And re the reason why that's so significant is because the NASDAQ has over 3,000 listed companies. And so now to have them report statistically data, statistical data on the demographics of gender, minority, and, and LGBTQ, and then explain why they're not, they're unable to find someone that falls into this category is significant. And so do, to your point, do I think more is coming? Uh, under our current chair, Chair Gary Gensler, uh, the thought is, is that much more uh, will be coming out in the space around transparency and corporate board diversity. Uh, uh, if you look at his regulatory agenda that was posted to the agency soon after he arrived to the SEC, he talks about the human capital management rule, which uh, requires companies to disclose matters that are material to their human capital. And I suspect diversity will be included uh, as part of that. I think on the asset management side, are we gonna see more in that space? Um, I think we will see more, more requests for disclosures based upon the chairman's speeches that he has given uh, around why the utilization of diverse asset managers uh, by companies as well. So. That's a long way of saying that, do I think more is coming? Yes, I think more is coming. 
Um, do I think, uh, and, and I'm not sure the New York Stock Exchanges or the other CBO or the other exchanges will be as bold as NASDAQ, but on the SEC part, I think that we can expect more to come in the space of diversity and board diversity. Wow, so we've got bold moves happening and more to come. Eric, I saw you get in position. You know I was coming to you next on this one. So we have these rules that are coming down, but some of them are being challenged, absolutely. But Eric, I would come to you and say, what are the realities of getting diverse talent on these boards? If the rules are coming, what are the realities of getting people who look diverse to be on these boards? Sure, and there's a there's a an internal and external component to uh, these activities. Uh, you look externally. I, I think uh, most would be surprised to hear that you know a, a number that hovers around 50% uh, in terms of pub large publicly traded companies that use executive search firms or advisors or consultants as part of their board process. So, and, and maybe it's not 50, but it's a number you know above 40% of companies still tap their internal networks to find board members. And as alluded to by, by Richick and, and, and Pam, uh, you know, there is a compliance issue that's going to be uh, emerging you know, in the near future along these lines. And simply having process in place is going to be one of the, one of the determinants for being able to move forward. Uh, stepping aside from that, that external interaction, there are some you know, uh, building blocks that go into identifying and, and uh, approaching and successfully recruiting diverse candidates to a board. Uh, one of the primary issues is the definition of what a qualified candidate looks like. Uh, historically, we fall into what is a bit of a golden triangle of CEOs, CFOs, or general consuls. And those, by and large, have represented the majority of board members historically uh, when considering board opportunities. Uh, the CEOs are comfortable with them. The boards are comfortable with these individuals because of their roles in the companies. They're in the room. They understand the numbers. They understand the complexities. Uh, all of that is great. And pipelining for diverse talent into those roles is something that should be continued, but will not alone address the issue. There's a finite number of these roles. A lot of what we do, uh, advocacy in the boardroom, is really around horizontal stretching and vertical stretching for candidate consideration. And, and simply put, horizontal stretching is thinking beyond just the general counsel and the CFO and CEOs or prior CEOs for other functional leadership that could have or provide some subject matter expertise that is very relevant to a variety of board issues, the CHRO, the chief information officer, the VP or SVP or EVP of supply chain to be, uh, to be topical, are all functional roles that could have significant impact on boards when properly framed. The, uh, let me just finish the vertical part and then jump in, Ellen. The vertical component is challenging companies to think beyond the CEO or their direct reports. So I would posit that if you were to consider Fortune 250 companies, SVPs at these companies who have billions of dollars of responsibility but may not report directly to the CEO, they can't go and join a mid-cap or small-cap board uh, and have significant impact and blow these folks away with their acumen experience and expertise. I think we've got to push vertically as well uh, for consideration. Yeah, I appreciate that, Eric, and both perspectives on that. So, so Kimberly, this does bring me to you to think about, we've heard over time the difference between the private equity boards and the publicly traded boards. So I love to hear from you. We've historically heard that there's lower representation in the private. I like to hear, is that the case? And if so, why are private equity lower numbers than publicly traded? Yes, absolutely. So I will say, you know, just looking at this, um, uh, definitely private equity, uh, privately held just definitely naturally falls behind and lags from a publicly traded organization and just quite naturally because of the systems and processes and and that's just a known fact um, and I think that that's just intuitively understood and that's something that we're working on um, just in general but I would say um, this is just an area that is definitely understood. There's a McKinsey study, and I think Richick actually 
uh, alluded to that at the beginning of this webinar, uh, that this is a focus because it's well known and, and understood the opportunities of focusing in this area. So um, there's a lot of benefits in terms of the risk on uh, for just evolving in this space, just in general. So going forward, um, for private equity, uh, for publicly traded organizations to be able to uh, just follow that suit, um, this space has a lot of benefits that we can actually glean upon, for sure. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, you have more to add on that, Kimberly? No, go ahead. Yeah, no, the only other piece that I was going to say is that, you know, um, we can definitely, you know, go forward with a lot of the metrics and goal setting, uh, D, D, E, and I criteria, uh, value creation, uh, compensation metrics, uh, more diverse equity uh, workforce improvement areas is what we're actually working on to evolve in that space, for right. sure. So using the metrics to drive the behavior. So Todd, I'm gonna come to you to give us a different perspective. So with North Coast Ventures, you're an early stage investor. And as an early stage investor, how might your diversity practices be different? Are there any uniqueness associated with the stage where you are in the organization? Yeah, I think there probably is. And you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, early stage can mean really early stage, right? So some of the companies we invest in have five to ten employees. Uh, at that level, a board is likely to have five people. And uh, most of those positions are, are filled uh, with a cast of characters that's relatively close to the company, at least in the first financing. And so that would be, if it's five people, very often two investors, you know, so one from each investor group, two people very typically from the company itself, and one independent. So I'd say that puts a lot of pressure on that independent seat because you're kind of dealing with the parties you're dealing with in those, those other areas. So identifying, uh, the right person is super important, and, and we found we just have to be, uh, you know, really intentional. You know, Eric mentioned, you know, using external resources, which we have the ability to use as companies are more mature and they have resources. But at the beginning, we are in some ways limited to our, our own uh, networks. And the notion of, as he mentioned, stretching horizontally and vertically is something that uh, we need to do. Uh, but not because we have to, actually because it's really good for us. Uh, in these early companies, what we really want is, is less about, say, a CEO or a CFO perspective, and is really industry expertise. And that's something I think we can find across uh, a lot of different areas. And just to give one example for one of our uh, portfolio companies, Amplifund, which is a, a grants management platform here in, in Cleveland, uh, we just kind of put together a wish list, and we happened to find um, – uh, a woman in New York who was until very recently uh, the CIO of the state of New York. So she had uh, government grants management experience. So the light kind of shined on our first view, you know, was, wow, this is a perfect person. We're so lucky. Then we realized, wow, we've got to fight for her. How are we going to attract her to want to be part of our team? Because she, her phone is probably ringing off the hook. So I, I think yeah, very quickly it's transitioned from us with these early stage companies, not just what would we like to do, but how are we really going to get out in the market uh, and be competitive to uh, attract diverse talent to our boards? There you go. And, and, and speaking of that, we have some questions that are going to be coming in the chat and we're inviting you in the Q&A to send us some, but I want to make sure we're following up on there. It's almost like there's a process here. So we have these rules that are being put out there and then we've got to recruit talent, which we've talked about. But I want to throw one more your way, Kimberly, because I once we recruit the talent, their voices have to be heard. So can you talk to us about what are some tips to ensure that when you're diversifying these boards and they become a part of them, their voice is actually going to be heard? Can you talk to us about that? Yes, absolutely. So it is very important to really understand uh, really the type of diversity that you are engaging on your board. So that could be very different. Um, it could be different ethnicities. It could be the various genders. And what is that dynamic, right? So I have, whether it be in the public sector, whether it be in the private sector, 
Um, it could be a very international board uh, with various uh, ethnicities. It's really just uh, looking at the chair and who's facilitating that board and having a very savvy chair that's facilitating and really understanding those dynamics. So whether you're utilizing technology to really uh, make sure that you're understanding that you're, inter you're uh, making sure that all of those voices are heard, but it's really making sure that you are leveraging that full body and breadth of that uh, board that you have embraced so that you're leveraging all of that. Um, and so really, you know, it's not just that piece, but it's also also the age as well as the breadth and different dynamics of the experience level. Or, you know, when you look at the importance of that board, it's also really uh, uh, making sure that, that you're maximizing that so that you're benefiting that throughout the, the breadth of your organization. So it's very critical. Yeah. And that's, and that yeah. Yeah, and I, I want to stick on that frame a little bit. And there's a question that came into the box here, and I'm going to read it. And I'll have you, you know, you, Kimberly, you may want to take a shot at it, but Eric, also, you may want to think about when we hear the question came in, when we hear the performance metrics of diverse companies versus non diverse boards, could it be that there are other casual factors or other factors? Might a company that has a diverse board and leadership be the result of the company with a better culture? and more forward thinking leadership generally. Maybe that's the reason. Eric, I see you perking up there, take it away. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Uh, that, that's absolutely correct uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, given the, uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in as a country and the attention to this, to, to many of these issues, uh, there's been a rush towards uh, the diversity officer in a variety of different situations and i think unfortunately uh people who step into senior level uh chief diversity officer types of roles are are learning that they're being asked to try to solve and fix a corporate culture uh, as compared to uh, addressing issues that are specifically germane to a uh, dei and the fact of the matter is you know, a chief diversity officer alone cannot fix a caustic corporate culture on their own so back to the McKinsey studies, uh, you know, I don't think at any point McKinsey would say there's causation, but it's sure, but the correlation is is readily apparent that companies that, for whatever reason, as alluded to by the by the question, uh, have the strong culture and can fold diversity and inclusion into that culture, seem to statistically perform better. Yeah, and, and Eric, I, I just want you to stay on that for one more moment. When you think about this, so the whole point now is we have these rules coming. We need to diversify these boards. We've got to get them on. They have to have a voice. Any other suggestions at this point about what we might do to increase the pool of candidates? How do we expand that? Well, you know, it, we've talked about the horizontal and the vertical stretching, but I think the, the earlier point that I made around uh, the percentage of boards that don't actually uh, bring in outsiders to assist, consultants uh, to provide guidance, uh, it, it's really, it's, it's access on two fronts. First of all, you would hope that any search firm or consultant is going to open up the aperture in terms of people that they're going to identify. But having a, an open aperture alone is not enough. You also have to navigate the, uh, the art and science of approaching candidates and the uh, the war for talent is quite real and exacerbated in these in these types of arenas where uh you know uh, as as todd's example the individual that you identified in new york their phone is ringing 24 hours you know a day for opportunities so the, the who you choose as your representative to to initiate that content to navigate that process is equally important as showing up with a laundry list of here are some great candidates uh, you know, clients or customers or those looking to fill up positions or board seats need to ask deeper questions about, well, if that's the list, how do we engage them? Who is engaging them? And these are uh, these are questions that should be internal and external. So companies are still going to choose to undertake these activities on their own at times. But if they do, they still should be holding themselves to those metrics about G chair person. Are you the right person to make that first phone call to this candidate? and have some dialogue around what's going to be most effective in those scenarios. Yeah, 
That's good. I appreciate that. And, and, and Kimberly, I'm going to come to you with this piece, because as we're thinking about diversifying the boards, making sure they have a voice, we know bias happens. Conscious or unconscious, it happens. So um, actually, you know what, Pamela, I'm going to have you take this one first, and then maybe Kimberly can say something and um, others. Are there some steps to help eliminate this bias or at least make it aware? So Pamela, things that you can think about, because it's happening and you have people getting on boards and not having great experiences. So can you talk about the bias that happens? Yes. Uh, so we, the first thing that I tell everybody, it's, it's what I've trained on, it's what I try to educate the workforce on is, one, just you have to acknowledge that we all are biased. We all bring who we are to the table, and that comes of a set of, of biases. Uh, you know, when I first started doing this work, People got real defensive when you talked about implicit bias or unconscious bias. It was as though a person was pointing their finger at them. Um, but I'm like, that's not me, that's you. <laughs> you know, you have, so first you have to acknowledge that it exists. Secondly, you have to make sure that there are structures and processes in place to abort it. So if you're hiring for a board member to your board, you know, one, have objective processes in place. To, to Eric's point, you know, should the chair, that, that should be the completion point, not the starting point of who meets the candidate that's considering for a board. And when you meet a candidate for a board uh, uh, slot, ask them all the same questions. Start to put into place objective questions. Uh, and that's just a few. I mean, I could go on and on, but the first is, the, the key takeaway is acknowledge that it exists, move on from that. Two, what systems or practices can we put in place to ensure that we're ridding out bias to the best way that we can? Yeah, there you go. And, and I'm going to have Kimberly then, Todd, go for these two. So Kimberly, I want your thoughts on retention of diverse board members. I want to hear that. And then Todd, I'm going to follow up with you to see venture and private equity. Are there any differences there? So Kimberly? Yeah. So the other recommendations that I would add to that is I think having an ESG policy is very helpful. I think having uh, clear metrics are very helpful. I think also taking it a step further to help move the needle would be having uh, tie-in metrics to compensation if you really want to put your money where your mouth is, tying it to executive comp. Um, and I think to Eric's point, you know, as he talked about how difficult it is to get very talented, uh, diverse board members to your firm, to your company, if you are really serious about it and you really want to get talented individuals, I mean, they're going to really ask, what do you have in place? Mm -hmm. You may be fortunate initially to get a couple of individuals, but you're not going to keep them unless you're very serious, right? So um, having these things in place, if you're really serious about moving the needle and you're really serious about making significant impact to your organization, you should really consider having these, these things in place. That's my humble opinion. Yeah, it sounds like it mirrors that of the people on the, the other panel, you know, like having some kind of policy structures and you hit us yeah. with time to that compensation and metrics. Now you're starting to hit the money. So Todd, oh, yeah. I'm going to say, yeah, <laughs> are there any differences when you start thinking about private equity and then um, brace yourself? Richard, I'm coming to you with a really tough one right after Todd. So brace yourself around that one. So Todd, what do you think? Are there differences, uniqueness in your space? I, I think so, and I think Kimberly alluded to this uh, earlier that with private companies, right, which is what you're going to see most typically in private equity and venture funded companies, there's just less visibility to what's going on at all le levels. And with less visibility comes less accountability. So I, I think that's probably a natural thing that, you know, you have to uh, work through. Uh, so, you know, it's one of the reasons why private equity and venture haven't done well historically uh, in, in inclusion efforts, right? They, there's just no getting around that. I, th I think the, uh, the results have been uh, poor, but I, I think there are some things changing. You know, Richick mentioned uh, some of the large banks like the Goldman's of the world are exerting their influence on what the board composition has to be. Uh, 
we all and uh, private equity uh, funders care about companies going public. That gets people to pay attention, right? So that's a big influence, or maybe just as big or bigger is just that the large institutional uh, LPs, the investors like pension funds and uh, university endowments are, are forcing uh, a lot of the investors to think about and to talk about and to focus on uh, inclusion, inclusion and uh, equity. And that's probably gonna be the biggest factor of all because that's the lifeblood of investment, right? Who is willing to deploy capital? Uh, and maybe a little less so on the talent side, but you know, they're, they're, the war for talent, as I think Eric said, is, is very real. Uh, demographically, startups and high growth companies tend to have a younger employee base. Uh, which typically has a stronger expectation around DEI. So knowing it's a competitive landscape, I think you, you have to be aware that uh, your leadership can't just be paying uh, lip service to this and that a, a recipe for winning is really doing the things that make your company more attractive in the eyes of your customers and in your employee base. And uh, more and more today, DEI is recognized to be one of those important things. And, and Todd, I, I love what you said in terms of less visibility. Sometimes we think that means less accountability. But as more and more things are changing and the spotlight is now on this, we're not going to be able to be high behind but not having the accountability. So I appreciate that. Now, uh, <laughs> Richick, I have one for you that's really interesting. Insurance coverage, something simple but as big as that. Can that board diversity impact that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it happens in a roundabout way. Um, there have been a number of lawsuits against companies for failing to have diverse boards. Uh, those lawsuits typically um, fall into, well, the claims fall into two categories. One, um, you know, they cite to the McKinsey study and say, listen, we would be, do our company would be doing better if we had more, uh, a more diverse board. Um, that runs into the causation correlation question that, that Eric raised. But the other one, uh, the other grounds that you see a lot of is companies are broadly making statements about their commitment to diversity, their a bit, you know, their desire to be a, a diverse and inclusive place. But when you look at their boards, you don't see that diversity there. Um, and in fact, a lot of these lawsuits, um, as part of the lawsuit, they'll send, they'll, they'll attach to their complaint pictures of the board, and it's usually all white people, maybe some white women, but typically all white people. Um, and so that's where kind of the, the basis for those lawsuits fall into what uh, Pam was talking about with respect to disclosures to investors. If you're telling investors that you guys are, you are committed to diversity and inclusion, um, and they should encourage them to invest in your company, um, and you're not doing that, then there remains there, there, that creates a question of whether or not that's a material misrepresentation that both the uh, shareholder could find actionable, um, and truthfully, if the SEC uh, decided that it wanted to, uh, through its purview, um, it wanted to get active in that space. Now, why I said that's a roundabout way to insurance costs is insurance costs go up typically for companies when litigation risk goes up. So the more that you see that these lawsuits are out there, the more, and these, these deep questions are being asked about your commitment to things like the climate, things like diversity, um, inclusion. Your insurance company, that you, when you're now seeking you know, DNI coverage or just other coverage, they're gonna start asking these companies, well, what are you doing? But more importantly, they'll say, what are you doing versus what are you saying? If they see an incongruity there, you're going to see you're going to see premiums go up because you've increased that insurance company's risk, and no insurance company wants to you know, wants to be in that world. Um, so as these lawsuits are kind of moving through, um, you know, kind of like a, a a a mouse through a snake, and you can see the bulge as it's going through, you're you know some of these things are get are going to shake out as far as. What are the legal standards? How does this affect fiduciary duties of board members? But what will certainly happen quicker than anything else is that insurance premiums are going to go up because companies will say to them, insurance companies will say to themselves, this is now a legitimate area of risk that we need to guard against. And our only way of guarding against it is increasing the premiums. Wow. 
And that's what hits. And that's why I started the question with the insurance, not the lawsuits, right? Because of the risk associated with it. Let me stop and see if there's just a couple more questions that are coming to Q&A. Before I get to those, anybody else want to take us up on that risk conversation around risk associated that others may not be thinking about? Well, I... Uh... I often you know, sit on panels and we have what they call SEC Speaks, uh, which takes place like for two days. Everybody in the industry gets uh, their continuing legal education and everyone at the SEC presents along with our chair and commissioners. And that was one of the things that I talked about in my presentation, that it was time that we were at the point now that diversity and inclusion needed to begin, begin to be baked in like IT, cybersecurity, ESG, all of these other things, because there were risks, particularly to compliance officers um, in companies. And so I do believe that there is continued risk. Uh, it's risk for not just assessing, you know, because my group puts out a diversity assessment report where we ask regulated entities that are overseen by the SEC to provide us with some intel into their diversity policies and practices. And, and, and the way that I've tried to encourage the industry to comp to submit them, voluntarily submit them to the SEC is by saying that even if you did the self-assessment, you're farther along in the DNI space than if you had not done it. Do you have these leading practices in place? Uh, because I think the longer we go down this road, the more risk and less tolerance people are going to have for people's unwillingness to become diverse and to embrace diversity as a value of an organization. Wonderful, I appreciate that. Eric, you had something? It's not risk specific, but it's, it's kind of pulling from what I've heard from everybody. So much of this, whether it is a venture, uh, venture backed company, a more mature private equity, or, or emerging publicly traded company, or even companies of, of, of the Fortune 500 variety, so many of these issues involve, you know, the parental conundrum of do as I say, not as I do. And I think at all different levels, even represented on this panel, uh, there's a there's a lot of this discussion to your portfolio companies, to the company that you're on the board of about taking care of these issues. But uh, a surprising or perhaps alarming number of companies don't actually turn the mirror on themselves and say, are we as a board actually uh, taking action in the way that we are directing our company, our portfolio company, to do so on these very issues. Uh, you know, the concept of, of self-assessment, succession planning, all of those, uh, all of those activities are going to help identify what are gaps in strategic opportunities that can provide windows into recruiting more diverse candidates into those slots. Yeah. yeah. One thing, if I could, uh, well, yeah, if I could, Helen, on on the risk question too is that you know we've talked about um you know increased costs things of that nature as far as our risk but you're also risking your access to capital um you are seeing many many more companies especially companies that are private that want to go public or that are private and want to be acquired by private equity um being asked questions about their commitment to diversity and inclusion and their board structure mostly because the companies, the, the entities that would be investing in them, either directly or indirectly, are being held to these ESG standards as well. And they don't want another, they don't want one of their portfolio companies or something down the line risking their status. It does not help, let's take a, a large pension fund that has professed that we are committed to diversity and inclusion, we believe in ESG principles, but if they're investing in companies that aren't doing those things, that splashback comes to them. And that then, makes them uh, more more hesitant to invest in companies that don't reflect those uh, those values. And one of the things where we're talking about assessments, um, and I'll, this, is, this is a GCP panel, so I might as well, you know, the GCP has an assessment tool that and companies can go through um, to kind of ask these questions of themselves. And one thing that when I'm asked to kind of help companies with these assessments to minimize their risks, I try to be very simple with it. And one of the two of the simple things that I give them are if the people that are making a decision or are doing a search all look alike, you have a broken process. Either you need to bring someone, you need to pay to bring someone in to, to diversify that room, or you need to look broader, broader within your own organization to diversify that room. Conversely, but relatedly, if everyone that you're interviewing 
looks like you, you have a broken process because you've not found someone that could actually, you know, that, that is of a different perspective. Um, and again, to fix that process, it's a question of, as I think uh, Eric uh, said very, very well, you know, you need to broaden your aperture and there are probably many people in your network or in your company that are diverse that can help you with that search that you've just not tapped yet and you should consider doing that. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And Todd, I'm going to come to you because I, I want to go to the practicality of it. So as an investor, right, your portfolio companies, how much can you really impact what happens in terms of inclusion at those portfolios? Let's get to, can, can you do that? How much impact can you have? Yeah, it, it varies to be sure. Um, you know, as, as a venture investor, we typically do not have a control position. So we own meaningfully less than half of the company. So I would say our influence can be meaningful, but is soft. And the more helpful we are, the more influence we kind of get, right? The, the more we step up and are able to fund and support and drive value for the company, the more influence uh, we have. So specifically to uh, filling out boards, to hiring senior team members, we can be helpful to companies by increasing visibility on their uh, open positions and needs, by targeting really specific high value uh, prospects. And if the outcome of that is better candidates and a faster process, you know, we get more influence. And that's our hope, right? We we think we kind of deserve the influence we get in these things, right? If we don't have a lot of influence in the companies, it's probably because we're not doing what we uh, are hoped, hopeful that we would be doing at the beginning. But I, I guess I'd also say that there's a little bit of a uh, Maslow's hierarchy of focus that these companies have, right? And until you have enough money to confidently meet your payroll for the next X, it's hard to worry about a lot of other things, right? So we've got to help them both get to that level where they can think about higher order things, and also when they're there to make those right smart uh, investments. But we don't have the luxury of having that control position where we get to say, here's what you need to do. We can say, here's what you should do and here's why and we can help you. Yeah, and so not a control position, but some influence. But I also wanna make sure companies are thinking about, even though I'm working hard, I, I can't make the payroll, this is my highest priority. Having diverse talent with creative and innovative thought can help you make the payroll. Right, and so starting to think about it from that perspective as well, uh, but understanding your position. So in the chat, if you've noticed, we put the link to the GCP assessment. It's backed by validated data and researchers who do this work. So you can take a look at that, um, it's organizations. Now there are a couple of questions in the chat. Eric, are you ready for one? One came sure. in about you, he says, bring it on. There's one in here that talks about the vertical and horizontals that you talked us through and wanted to ask about, is this pointing to, is the lack of diversity a supply problem or a demand problem? And anybody else can jump on that if you want, but let's start with Eric, what do you think? Well, I, I think uh, historically it's it's been demand and increasingly as we've brought this to light, it becomes a supply issue. So again, if, if you're playing within a classic construct, CEO, CFO, general counsel, there is no amount of pipelining that's going to change the needle on the number of candidates available in the next 25 years, if that's your only definition. So you've got to think about it more broadly about the supply issues and hence the, the stretch horizontally and vertically. Okay. I Just to jump on that, I think that it is less of a supply problem. It is certainly a demand problem, but I also think it's an exception problem in the sense that, you know, many institutions will say what, what, what Eric is saying is that I want someone with C-level experience but if they meet someone or that that you know at their at their country club or their trade association that doesn't meet those uh, those standards, they'll make an exception for them because they have other talents that you want to to utilize. Women and minorities don't get the exception benefit. We are always you know I, I don't want to be too broad about it, but oftentimes you know I don't understand why that exception couldn't work in our favor. That this person might be an SVP as opposed to a C level person. And so, but he has lots of really good insight on cybersecurity or ESG issues. And so we should make an exception to our process for them. You don't see a lots of exceptions being made currently, I think for uh, minority and female candidates, because I kind of reject the notion that this is a pipeline problem. I think that 
it is a lack of vision for the people that are where they're looking for the pipes. Right. And so, well, let me ask you this. So another question came in the chat that I think think fits right alongside of this, and anybody can take it. You know, we have the organizations who might say it's a pipeline problem. Still, the diversity has not happened. The question came in: Do you see a future where investors might actually uh, take action, initiate actions against a non-diverse company that underperforms? They already okay. have. That's part of these lawsuits that have already been filed. Right now, it's weird. They the one of the they went after. Um, there was an article in Newsweek that preceded a bunch of these things that highlighted. 30 companies that didn't have black directors. And so many of these lawsuits were originally filed against those companies. And the basis for the lawsuit for the injury was that A, the company would have done better than it had been if they had diverse directors. But soon you are going to see, you know, this kind of opens the door for those lawsuits where a company that is not performing well, um, and I'm gonna hazard a guess that you're gonna start seeing it in the consumer goods space where consumers, are very diverse now. Demographics are working in our favor. So if a consumer company does not have a diverse board and they're underperforming um, in the market, you could see a claim against them because there's a direct line between what they're trying to do and the diversity of the group that they're trying to cater to. It'll be harder for um, you know to go after a business to business company or like a a uh, 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 you know aircraft manufacturer. But for a consumer company, they should be very concerned about those linkages being made and anything that's consumer basing. But it's also why you see those companies taking the lead in a lot of the diversity, um, in the you know, in, in diversity in leadership and in diversity on boards, because they recognize that they need to understand their company, uh, their customers better. Yeah, and, and to Todd's point, as you see more and more visibility, more and more accountability. Let me go to one last question that I see in the Q&A. Any resources to assist with locating diverse members for nonprofit boards? We get that a lot. So Eric, I'm Kimberly, I'm not sure who wants to jump in. Eric, this is your groundwork around recruiting. What are some of the uh, resources for locating talent? Uh, so you know, use a search firm. Hey, there's an idea. <laughs> but that's not always a viable option, depending on where you are in, in, in your continuum, whether it's a nonprofit resources or early stage uh, development companies that, that Todd interacts with, and there's just not budget for it. But I, I think there are uh, there are national level advocacy organizations that you can tap into, and then there are regional and city related organizations that correlate well to those national organizations. Uh, a diverse advisory board, perhaps, is a mechanism to uh, to access that. I think Richick said, dig deeper into the organization, ask around. But the simple establishment of an advisory board, a non-paying advisory board where that expectation is managed up front, but you're you're there to serve as a window and access point to uh, to drive uh, interaction and opportunities, you know, could be one avenue to explore. And I like to add, I, I think people have to use their chief diversity officers if you have them. They are relationships, they are affinity groups, they are national bar associations if you're looking for lawyers for every affinity group, they are associations, you know, because that's that's your pipeline relationship building and your go-to organizations. You know, you just can't wake up one day and say, okay, I want these these people. You should use your organization, your structure, your chief diversity officer, your Chico, to build relationships with the community in which you exist so that you know the leaders that you're looking for. When when um, I spend a lot of my time building relationships because I know it's hard for people that work for publicly traded companies uh, and even some of our, the entities that we regulate to think about becoming to coming to public service. Uh, but it requires me to have longstanding relationships uh, so that I know the pool of candidates when a new chair comes in and is looking for diverse talent, that I have these relationships. I can, I can get in front of him two or three candidates to interview. So I think that we have to understand that it's not built overnight, that we have to make some level of commitment to building relationships in the structure that Eric is talking about, in our community, in our network, um, because they do exist, the supply does exist. Yeah, I right. tell my clients that if you don't have diversity amongst your tr your trusted advisors, your lawyer, your accountant, your, you know, however, your management consultant, then you need to start trusting some new people um, yeah. because the, the world has changed 
And so who you trust and where you get your advice should probably change as well. Yeah, let me just get Kimberly in here as well. That's good. The world is changing. We better change with it. Kimberly, tell us what, a, what about it. So, thank you, Ellen. I was just going to jump in here and pal on and just say a little bit of the same of what has already been mentioned. To your point, Pamela, it is exactly what you said. It's palling on and utilizing your your resources. So if it's not your chief diversity officer, then it's your CHRO who's also plugged in to professional networks and uh, those organizations and just leveraging that resource and finding those uh, those individuals. So thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for giving me that platform. <laughs> we've, we've had a great panel. I know we're getting close to time here. Uh, can you hang in there for one more universal question for all of you? I'm going to throw one. I just want your, your most concise answer. Just give it to me. Punch it in there for me. Uh, Richie, I'm going to start with you first. I'm going to give you all the same question. How long do you predict? You, wait, you ready for it? How long do you predict before we're not having this conversation anymore? Richie, get us started. I'm hoping that it's in my lifetime. Um, but I think that demographics um are going to dictate that this change these changes have to be made so i think that it will be within my lifetime probably in the next 10 to 15 years um but i would rather that we did this by choice and not rely on darwin here you go all right todd what do you think yeah well maybe richick's lifetime will extend a little more than mine <laughs> but i guess my tendency is to say probably never but I, I do think the nature of the conversation is is changing i think the arc is uh in, improving just some of the things i heard on this call about how uh accountability is increasing between what you represent and what you do it feels like we should have a reasonable expectation of improvement along these lines but there's got to be a lot of pushing along the way for a conversation like this to go away and th that's a lot to expect but yeah all right get me there kimberly we got a minute or two left what do you think I feel very encouraged that we're able to continue to have these types of thought provoking conversations. And as long as this momentum continues, I feel that within our life, within my lifetime, I feel that we'll see the change. Wonderful, Pamela. I hope it never stops. I think the world is always changing. I think that we, we think it's all about women and minorities. It's about LGBTQ issues. It's about individuals with disabilities. So the categories and the, and the things that we think about when we think about diversity keeps expanding. So I hope it continues to go on because I think it's a value add to every company to continue to think about, are we the most inclusive that we can be? Absolutely. Eric, your perspective. Sure. I, I think it's never because it's never ending. And to borrow from a manufacturing analogy and thinking about uh, lean manufacturing and how you want to bake in the, the constant evaluation of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how to make that better, a lot of the conversation is going to be around uh, empowering everyone within the organization to continue to think about these issues and act upon them. So never but never ending. Never but never ending. Good point. Thank you to the panel. I really appreciate the comments. I know the audience appreciated them. Richard, Todd, Kimberly, Pam, Eric, thank you. We appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to you, Joanna. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing such great information and insight with us today. And thanks to all of you for participating in today's webinar. We hope you found this webinar engaging and informative. If you have thoughts to share, please let us know. Until then, this concludes today's session. Thank you again.